Welcome to the Tomorrow Today podcast. My name is Bushle Lameni and I'm excited to welcome you back to season two, where we'll continue helping you map the future of business. In this season, we are switching things up a bit. I will remain your host for the podcast, while my colleague Graham Codrington will be out and about in the field doing interviews with business leaders, industry experts, and authors for our episodes. We will pack this new season with practical insights and nuggets you can go out and apply immediately in your work and business. So welcome to the first episode of season two of the Tomorrow Today podcast. For this episode, we're going to be looking at creating a workplace culture where mastery is valued and intentional. One of the challenges facing leaders today is how to maintain high performance in the organizations and teams. In other words, how can you as a leader get the best out of your people instead of just getting the most out of them? More and more people are complaining about finding it difficult to stay motivated and give their best in their work while achieving consistent results. If you are a leader, that's a big problem you should really, really care about. It's estimated that an average adult living in the United States, or any developed country for that matter, will spend approximately 90,000 hours, or one third of their lives, at work. Just let that sink for a minute. 90,000 hours, or one third of your life at work. (laughs) That's a lot of time to spend anyway. So it is highly important that you should work at a place where you really enjoy and not just merely enjoy work. As we said in the previous season, I think we really set and uh, laid a really good foundation about what's important about the future of work and what leaders need to think in order to create a future fit workplace and a future fit culture. The way that we used to work will no longer cut it for the future of work and people. So, How do we keep people productive, motivated, and engaged in their work with increasing demands and a fast-changing workplace? Professor of Business Administration Rosabeth Moskenta of Harvard Business School says that the keys to work motivation and engagement boils down to the three M's. Mastery, membership, and meaning. So, For you as a leader to tap into these three M's, leaders at all levels need to rethink how they define strategy, jobs, and culture. I love this concept of three M's, and uh, we often speak a lot about them uh, here tomorrow today. That means that if we're serious about high performance, we've got to prioritize the culture we create. And according to Moss Cantor, That means developing cultures where people have a sense of mastery, membership or belonging, and meaning. So for this episode, let's just take a look at one of those M's, creating a culture of mastery. How can you as a leader foster an environment where employees are encouraged to master their roles, their time, and energy effectively? Let's unpack a few things before we hear from our first guest for the season. How do we define mastery? In the workplace, mastery is more than just being competent. It's about continually learning. It's about improving and refining your skills to achieve excellence and peak performance in your role. It's also about maintaining a level of excellence in the quality of the work that you produce. In a nutshell, being in control of your output and giving your best consistently. So you probably have seen this scenario played out many times where individuals and teams occasionally produce amazing results that are enough for us to keep them employed, but then fail to consistently deliver on that high performance. It's almost the hit and miss scenario as it were. We believe that leaders can create a culture of mastery where individuals and teams maintain high performance. One company we heard about realized that one of the keys to mastery 
and high performance lies in giving people time to rejuvenate regularly by seriously observing and taking time off work completely. Think about that. That one of the things that you can do to achieve mastery is to take time off work. And when you're off, stay off completely. <laughs> Shashank Nigam, founder and CEO of a small aviation consultancy, Simply Flying, found out a few years ago that his team members were overworked. And as a result, their work was suffering. And so he went out and he mandated that everyone in the company should take mandatory time off for a week after every seven or eight weeks. Let me repeat that. Take mandatory time off for a week after every seven or eight weeks. And while they are off, they're not allowed to do any work related activities or they will be penalized. <laughs> Imagine that, being penalized for not working by your boss. Yes, that's what they did because they took this very, very seriously. Once they started doing this though, something really amazing started to happen for the organization. People were more energized. It led to more innovation and creativity and higher quality in results and engagement. So, so before you ask, does this work? They have already proven it. It works. So to shed more light into this subject, we have a very special guest interview for this episode. My colleague Graham Codrington spoke to Sipiwe Moyo. Sipiwe Moyo is an expert in HR and organizational behavior. After many years of leading HR and L&D functions in three big corporates, he set up his own consultancy to provide organizational behavior, insights, and services. Sipiwe is a top-rated speaker um, and best-selling author and one of Tomorrow Today's global associates. Now, for this season, Graham will be going out and interviewing our special guests. And one of the questions he will be asking them, or the main question he is going to be asking them, is for them to expand on their big idea for future-proofing business for the 2030s. In this interview, Sipiwe shares his big idea, how leisure can be a catalyst for workplace success. Let's take a listen to the interview. Sipiwe, thank you for joining me. And here's my question. What's your big idea to help companies future-proof themselves for the 2030s? Graham, this is going to sound a little bit counterintuitive. My big idea is employers, leaders should be interested on the le leisure activities of their employees. That is a big idea. It feels a little bit like Big Brother, but we'll come back to that. I'm sure you don't mean it in that way. Before we dig into your big idea, just tell us a little bit about who you are. We've heard your CV, but like, what makes you tick? What makes you interested in, in people? So I'm really, really passionate about making sure that, you know, workplaces are, are places where people can really, really thrive, that work does not have to be a drag that people can show up um, at their workplace and, and really, really flourish. The idea that you have to leave uh, corporate and leave work in order for you to flourish, I think it's a very limited idea. I don't think people should enjoy weekdays so that they enjoy weekends only. So so that's who I am. Um, that's what I try and study. I try and make sure that whatever environments we can create in the workplace uh, are, are, are to a point, to a degree, allowing people the creativity, the space, the autonomy to bring their best selves. And these days you do that uh, as a consultant, as a speaker uh, with businesses, but you've also got a uh, background in corporate as well, right? You're not just uh, looking in from the outside. You've, you've been inside uh, these companies. Yeah, I, I have a background in corporate, in HR, in organizational behavior. And, and you know, many people always congratulate me for leaving the bad world uh, so that I can consult. And, and for me, I don't see it like that at all. When I was in corporate, I had instances in corporate 
where I felt like I was still using uh, the, some of my best gifts. Of course, there are other instances where you felt like you are quite constrained. And that's why I really, really am passionate about when we get this thing right, we can create an environment where people can really, really flourish, even within a big organization. Hmm. And just so people know why I wanted to speak to you, uh, give us some uh, uh, insight into the latest book that you've read. And I say that because I can't keep up with your output. I'm very jealous with how you write your books. But just uh, let people know a little bit about what books they could buy if they, if they find your uh, insights interesting. Uh, I think the latest book that I've written is called Your Next Move. And just figuring out what, how do you position yourself for your next move? And then the other one is quite a little bit academic, positive organizational behavior, the Southern African perspective. So in that, I really, really am interested in this idea that, you know, strength-based leadership, things like hope, optimism, things like resiliency, when you unleash that in people in the workplace, you, you can create an environment where people thrive as opposed to just languishing or just meh. Okay, so now let's get back to your big idea because uh, we, we, we've established that you're not just sucking something out of your thumb. You, you, you've been there, done that. You know what you're talking about. You know what you're trying to achieve. Uh, you say that you suggest that employers should take an interest in the leisure time of their employees. Uh, what do you mean by that and, and why should they do it? It's, it's an interesting uh, concept for me, Graham. And as I was looking at it is uh, we obviously know that the recovery period that people have maybe over the weekends or even uh, during the evenings is very important for how they show up the next day. And, and interesting studies are starting to, Look, to tell sorry us. Sorry to interrupt you, but for okay. some employers, even that piece of information is important because <laughs> with WhatsApp and cell phones now, I mean, it is actually Australia has just made the rule that you are legally allowed to ignore your employer on the evenings and the weekends. France has made it illegal for employers to contact people over the weekends. But there are many employers around the world who've just abandoned all thoughts that you have an evening and a weekend. I'm, I'm, I'm being cheeky about it. But, mm. you know, there's some companies that would, if they got that right, it would be uh, an improvement. But sorry, I interrupted you. Keep, keep going. Yeah, we we you, agree on that as a starting point. You, you're so right, uh, Graham. I think that the culture of always on, I don't think people really, really understand because we, we have this always on culture and we think that it is good for us as employers, right? If if someone does not switch off uh, in the evening and they can answer my email at 8 or 9 p.m., that means they've switched on. That means they, they are committed to the organization. But what we know is that the quality of those output is not great at all. So when people are always on and they don't have that psychological detachment from the workplace, their creativity goes down, their innovation goes down, so yes, they are on, but they are just not giving us the quality that we need in the in the workplace. So so the recovery period is really really important. And 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 I, I think th there was one organization. I don't know if it was Volkswagen where I think uh, they they created a a hack in the system where if you send an email on Friday, it sits somewhere in the server and and you only get it on on Monday, mainly because I think you're right that that was Volkswagen. Yeah. 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 So one way to do it would be like France and Australia to make a rule for the country. Another way to do it would be like Volkswagen. They come in with an IT system and, and maybe block the emails from going through the email server until Monday morning. But you're, you're pushing us a bit further. You, you're saying that the employer should actually, what was your word, take an interest in? Uh, the leisure time. What what do you mean by that? It, as I say, my initial reaction was it felt a bit like Big Brother. Now my my boss is not only checking up that I've delivered the project; he's also checking up I'm going to gym. Uh, is that what you mean, or, or or what do you what do you think we should be doing? So so an interest, um, is, uh, and that that's phrased quite intentionally. An interest um, is is the right word. In other words, uh, trying to check what. Uh, how was your weekend and so on. So one of the things that we are also finding is that the quality of that leisure time is also important. So not only is it important for you not to work, 
but what you do in that leisure time is important. So, so sitting and watching TV the whole day or, 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 uh, and, and not having time outside is not good quality leisure. So leisure crafting and making sure that people are doing things that are in their best interest and so on, that's, that creates that detachment even better than watching TV all the time. So, so, so we should be interested in what people actually do in their leisure day, in their leisure time, and not as a big brother, but as a form of encouraging, as a form of creating some kind of a, a club, a running club, or some kind of a, a hiking trip and so on uh, as, as teams, because firstly we can, where possible, we can work on our team cohesion, but what it also does, it helps those people who do not even know how to craft leisure activities, and we take this for granted, uh, that they will be able to piggyback on that and we can almost uh, have cohesion at the same time, but also have the quality of those leisure activities that we are talking about. Because as we know, if the quality is right, then the creativity, the innovation will be, will be right. Now, that, that's a great point, actually, that we take for granted that people actually know how to have leisure time. And I suppose also in different parts of the world, this would land differently, but certainly in the environment we are familiar with in a country like South Africa, and it's probably true in other parts of the world where some of your uh, employees might not have uh, their as, as much um, resources and means as, as others do, then taking an interest is more than just asking whether you did it. It's mm -hmm. enabling it to happen. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you could imagine, for example, uh, giving the, the gift of movie ticket vouchers to a staff member uh, and saying, you know, you, you need to use this by the end of the month and there's one for your, your, your partner as well or, or a voucher for a restaurant or something. So it, it's about more than just um, asking them whether they did it. It's about making sure that they are capable of doing it. Um, in Have they got enough money to do it? Do they need childcare? to look after the kids? Um, would they need to leave maybe slightly earlier on a Friday afternoon in order to be able to take that gap? And so, it, yeah, I hear you. It's not Big Brother taking over and checking up on them, but it's enabling something we know is actually quite important. Yeah, that's absolutely, that's absolutely correct. In fact, in some of the EAP em employee as assistant programs, they've done exactly what you are saying. So in a in a way that is almost a, a benefit of some sort. So the movie vouchers, mm. um, the restaurant, um, the, the ability to, to go on some uh, hiking trips and paying for people to do that, almost like a points system as we are using all those points um, and, and, and people enjoy those types of things when an employer does that because you, you just cannot... Uh, uh, you know, take for granted that people actually have the means to do that. But also there is a, also an, an interesting element. So in some of the Western countries where uh, they always own culture and the, I think the over hyping of, of I'm hectic, you are hectic, or oh, we are hectic and, and not using. So we, we know that there are really nice cu cultures where, people even the way they introduce themselves they use hobbies to introduce themselves because that particular culture your hobbies are very important but in the western world uh, it's almost better to talk about what do you do as opposed to what sets you on fire so even those people start getting permission to participate in hobbies to understand leisure activities because you and i know this graham so even if you give permission for people to to go and have these leisure activities as a leader you set the tone so if you're going to participate in those things if they see you on some cycling tour and you're participating as well it gives people permission to do that because in so many other organizations we've had where you know the leader says it's okay to take time off but they never take the time off and the what what people are hearing is no it's not okay to take that time off so so as a leader when you are participating in those things as well it just gives people permission to be able to do it so 
I'm hearing that behind the the single headline that you've given us, there's more of a mindset shift that you're inviting us to take. And the mindset shift is we can't be in an always on environment that no. giving people that disconnect and distance uh, regularly from the workplace is important. And it's important enough that the boss, the workplace, the colleagues should be involved in ensuring that it happens. Um, and that the leaders should lead in doing it as well. And, and I like what you said that it's, it can be as simple as just uh, normalizing the fact that you lead your introductions and your connection meetings, not with, are my tasks complete? Is my inbox empty? But rather with, these are my hobbies. Mm -hmm. This is how I relax this weekend. Mm -hmm. This is the last movie that I've watched. And if somebody on your team can't say how they relaxed, where they took leisure, and so on, then that would be something that you as the boss might want to just take an interest in mm. uh, and make sure that they do get that gap and that they understand the value of the gap. I love it. Absolutely. And, 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 and I'm also interested because, you know, many people, when we talk about something like this, it doesn't sound very business-like. It's almost like people always think that well-being and, and performance are mutually exclusive concepts, but we already know that they're not. So we have to be interested in leisure. We know that it enhances creativity. We know that it, it, it helps to increase meaning at work because by pursuing the activities that align with my personal values over the weekend, you know, that individual can then foster a greater sense of, I guess, purpose and, and satisfaction, which will translate into finding deeper meaning back into the workplace. It will improve work engagement if we probably do it as a, as a team. It will obviously also, I guess, reduce our stress levels because when you reduce your stress levels, it means you show up a little bit better in the workplace. And then also there is that, you know, better work-life integration. So, so I, I really am putting up the case for leaders to be as interested in, in whether employees have these leisurely activities, particularly uh, for that de detachment that we, we are talking about. Detachment is very, very important for productivity. It is very, very important for, 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 for us being able to get the outcomes that we want, which is productivity, uh, performance, and so on. Brilliant. Well, Sabira, I think you've made your case uh, very well. I know that this links in very nicely to a concept that at Tomorrow Today we talk about peak performance. Mm. And and we use, often use the athletes as an example, that there's no way an athlete, whether it's a football player or rugby or a runner, that they can always just be giving their 100% physical activity. They've got to take time for recovery, for rest, um, and, and that then allows them to come back even stronger, even faster next time. And, and I think that that's a, a great thing for us to do with our employees as well. Uh, Sabiwe, thank you very much for your time. How can people get hold of you if they uh, are interested in getting more of these types of insights into how to get the most out of our people? I guess, Graham, the, the easiest will be uh, cpwemoyo.com. There are some free resources that people can just download um, uh, if you go cpumoil.com, you'll find me there. Perfect. And we'll, we'll put that into the show notes as well so everybody can find you easily. Sipewe, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. There you have it. Some excellent insights from Sipewe's big idea, how leisure can be a catalyst for workplace success. Well, let's look at some of the key takeaways from that interview maybe, and think about how we can apply them in the way that we lead and the way that we work in order to lead to peak performance. One of the key takeaways from this interview is that it's not enough for you as a leader to say that you care about your people and your teams. You need to be invested and take a special interest in your employees' leisure activities. Okay, okay. Not in a creepy way. I can see how that could sound, you know, like it's not enough that uh, we care about your work, but we're also going to care about what you do when you're not working. <laughs> but think about it really profoundly, because 
if you should care that your team is not only doing their work well, but that they are fulfilled and that they have time for the things that really energize them and keep them motivated to deliver at their best. So leisure activities can enhance creativity and innovation. Actually, experts in this field have found that one of the ways to create mastery is not only just to focus on mastering your own tasks and skills at work, but also applying yourself outside of work. And um, so time off or time to relax is not just about that um, time of sitting by the couch or relaxing and uh, reading a book, but it can also be things like going out and doing your hobbies and some of your activities that require you to apply yourself, to have mastery, to have skill, but while you are enjoying yourself. Because when your brain is um, involved in these kinds of activities that might seem like a leisure activities uh, compared to your work activities, what it actually does is that it, 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 it energizes your brain and it gives your brain that extra ability to be more creative and more innovative. And so as leaders, it is important to model mastery to our teams through leisure participation ourselves. And, uh, and how many times do you share with your teams uh, about what you do as part of your leisure? And also how, how many times do you actually bring leisure activities into the workplace, allowing your teams to really enjoy themselves? Lots of ideas um, and food for thought uh, uh, from this interview uh, as you help your team and your people attain mastery in order to bring the best out of people and not just the most. So mastery is as much about what you do, not do, as it is about what you do do. <laughs> it is about peak performance and excelling at what you do. And for that to happen, it also means that you have to do self-mastery and learning what you need to do to keep your energy and creativity up. Whether that's time for relaxing or doing leisure activities that fuel your passion. We always like to end each episode with a question for you to consider. Now that you've heard us talk about mastery and talking about leisure, the question that I have for you is, what is it that you're going to try to do with your team in order to create that culture of mastery? Yes, it is about pushing your people to uh, do what they do at their best of their, uh, best of their abilities. But it is also about understanding that we've got to create space and allow people to actually master themselves to feel energized going forward. So I would like you to think about practical things that you're going to do differently going forward in order for you to create that sense of mastery and to create leisure and work. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Tomorrow Today podcast. We hope that you found it insightful and helpful for your business journey. And so please go ahead and check out the show notes to recap on what was covered in this episode and also follow us on social media with the links that are provided. And remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you are listening to us right now. See you in our next episode of the Tomorrow Today podcast, Mapping the Future of Business. <laughs>